Ráda bych vás přivítala na prezentaci Hrejtnej Hort. Je to jeden titul, který je v naší mezinárodní soutěži nezávislých počítačový her. Tuhle hru si můžete zahrát na základě inspirace jejich tvůrců a vývojářů v první patře měštěnské besedy na náměstí. A to najdete všechny městné mezinárodní soutěže. Je mi velkou ctí přivítat tady na celý, celý jejich tým. Takovou prvičkou, kterou by vám řekla, mi možná nezmíní, tak jsou to v podstatě vývojáři na cestách. A nemají jedno stále působiště, ale vlastně měsíc od měsíce cestují a tvoří tam, kde to zrovna baví a chtějí tam být. A ještě závěr bych dodala, že ta prezentace bude celá v angličtině, tak to potřebuje český překlad. Vzadu jsou sluchátka, je možné je využít. A stejně tak, když budete mít dotazy v průběhu nebo na konci přednášky, a zvedněte ruku, my vám dáme mikrofon, aby to právě zase slyšeli kolegové připadatelé v kabině, tak abyste byli dobře slyšet tady v sále. A další přednášky programu nebo úvěry pro první tak dneska, tak zítra. Na to navazuje i expo, které je na měšťanské vysedě, můžete si tam zakázat nezávislý chemí vývojářů. Budu se mě rádi, když jim dáte nějaký k tomu. A, a to je asi tak všechno. Rád bych vám popřála hezký den, a hezký zbytek festivalu a předávám slovo tvůrcům Hrejkvot. Cat creature. 
uh, and you've been separated from your family during a dramatic ecological disaster. A huge storm and a flood has washed you from your family and brought you to the shores of some unknown land. Um, you must navigate through a huge, diverse, open-world ecosystem of creatures. Uh, you have to hunt food, you have to avoid predators, and you have to find shelter. You're kind of just doing what little animals do every day. And the alien creatures in this world um, exist perpetually, meaning that when they're offspring, uh, they still exist. They're hunting food, they're finding uh, shelter, they're getting into territorial squabbles, just like you are. And, uh, yeah, so even like if, if in a traditional video game, when you go off screen, like Super Mario Brothers, for instance, um, only the things on screen exist for the most part. They're, they're just like ghosts that appear when necessary. In Ring World, all of the creatures that we're going to talk about all exist um, within, even if Tank Room is away or something like that, they're still mauling around and they're still going about their business. Basically, the idea is that in many, many video games, even though they are challenging, they are always catering to the player. The entire game world is like built for the purpose of the player passing through it. And oftentimes the game world is sort of lit up as you enter the area, and then the area is turned off as you exit. But what we wanted to do is something more like uh, an ecosystem simulation, which could exist with or without you interacting with it. So it's just like uh, toiling along. along by itself, and we drop the player into this sort of unequal, unequal ground to the other creatures. So what is procedural animation? Procedural animation is uh, an animation technique that's very, very extensively used throughout the, the project. And basically the difference between procedural and classical animation is that classical animation, um, the animator will be drawing Every single, uh, every single little frame, every single instance of animation. Whereas in a procedural animation system, what I as an animator do is I set up a bunch of rules for how uh, the computer will then render the animation frames. Um, and uh, one, one thing that's cool about that is that uh, you never get the exact same piece of uh, animation twice because the, I have the, the, the rule set which uh, which under which underlies the animation is dependent on like many many contextual views such as what is the terrain looking like or which velocity if it's every piece of it which you're moving with etc etc and those things will never be exactly the same so the animation is always varying a little so what are we seeing here? We're seeing this sort of transparent looking slug cat with some red dots. He's kind of moving around. You can see that hands and legs grabbing on things. A tail moving down. What's the significance of all of this? Uh, so the red dots are sort of what is actually going on behind the scenes. The red dots uh, represent the skeleton of the creature. And for those of you who know a little bit of programming, they are basically a 2D vector. 2D position vector with a 2D velocity vector attached to it, uh, and they are attached to each other at certain distances. So, mathematically, uh, as in the physics simulation that is going on, it is only the red dots. What I then do is, in the second step, I draw something that's similar to like a paper paper cutout paper cutout doll on top of the red dots and I align the different pieces of the paper doll to the dots. So if the arm is pointed up or if the arm is pointed down, I take the arm graphic and I like follow, follow the dots. You can sort of see right now with the Slugcat character on the screen, um, you have the, the red dot sort of represents the limbs to a degree, and you can see kind of like the tail will just like flop around. And that's because the tail is just this paper doll physics simulation Laying over the top of the movement of the character. Right? Yeah, and you can see like many. Right now, all the dots look the same size, but they are sort of like a little bit of uh, difference in them. So there's one dot for the upper body, there's one dot for the lower body, and then one for each hand. And the tail is actually just what is it, five dots or something like that that are connected to each other in a linear fashion, A to B, B to C. 
and that makes for the tweeting, tweeting motion. So we're kind of just dropping you into a lot of technical stuff right now. <laughs> but as the talk goes on, hopefully we're going to go piece by piece and we'll show you what creates a situation like that. So, shall we get into some rainbow creatures? Yeah, let's just show some stuff. Um, this creature here is called the vulture, and it's a big flying predator uh, that the player character has to watch out for. And, and the idea with this one is that it's sort of like a mixture between a vulture, a monkey, and an octopus, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, it has these like huge flying appendages that can be wings. <laughs> they can be wings or they can be uh, climbing arms so they can switch between different, different types of locomotion. These guys are centipedes. They're disgusting looking. Uh, yeah, they're basically just giant bugs. And you can see there's a kind of clockwork motion to how they work. So it's sort of all of them will move kind of at the same time and then stop. It's, it's gross. You can see some really interesting inverse kinematics with the limbs, how they kind of like grasp onto the territory. That's something we're going to go into a little bit more detail about later. Uh, how to make the limbs actually grab the terrain. Uh, and that's that's something you can see here. Uh, another another thing to point out is like all of all of these creatures to some degree take inspiration from the new life creatures and uh, with but like twisting it. So here for example centipede, a real life centipede, it's a little bit ambiguous, which is the front end and which is the back end. And it's like a slightly clean aspect of the centipede. So the rainbow one centipede is actually completely symmetrical. The front end or the back end, it might turn around at any time and use the previous pattern of the front end. Well, that's What's this big boy? Uh, this is called a rain a deer. We actually took suggestions for creatures early on in the project, and someone noticed that the game was called Rain World, and they <laughs> came up with this pun of the reindeer, and we had to figure out the creature that could conceivably be called a reindeer. This is it. And what are those little tentacly beasts down at the bottom? Uh, that's worm grass. That's. Um, and then we want me. And then it's like a yeah. uh, carnivorous grass. Yeah. We'll grab you if you if you fall it. And these guys are lantern mice, which you can see oh, sometime. They sort of have bioluminescence to them. They're they're very dumb, but you can uh, grab them and you can use them to illuminate dark areas if you can catch them. This creature we call the Leviathan. Uh, it's a big, uh, big water dwelling monster. Yeah. You don't see it very well here. That's sort of the idea. We want to like, play, play into the fear of murky, mur deep murky water. It's like if you combine a whale with tentacles and teeth and all, all the things you would want to see. This was very much, this game was like processing through our fears. <laughs> this is one of my favorite creatures. These guys are called Miros birds. And they're kind of like large, giant, squawking chickens. Um, they have sort of mechanical limbs. In, in the game, they're, they're extremely noisy. They like make clanking, and you can see their beaks kind of like have a scissor effect. And they're constantly like snapping each other. Actually, you didn't see much at all up there. <laughs> It looks good on this screen. Yeah, it looks really good. These are lizards. That's a very common creature in uh, the Wayne World game. It's sort of like the standard adversary of the slug cat. The, the lizard is a uh, medium sized uh, creature which will hunt creatures that are smaller than it. And it has this sort of neon, neon glowing head. They come in different colors, so these are the yellow lizards which cooperate in hunting packs. They will try to surround and surround their prey and attack them differently. And how many lizards, are, how many different species of lizards are there in the game? Maybe 10, 14, something like that? No, it's 14. Maybe 10. Maybe 10. And each one of them has different artificial intelligence. They hunt in movies, they 
a different sense of this and they behave very differently. And uh, this guy right here, this is kind of the jewel, the AI jewel of the rainbow ecosystem. This is a scavenger, and it was created to kind of match the, all of the potential of the player character. So it can use tools, it can, um, similar to how we were talking about um, locomotion switching rules, this one can travel on the ground perfectly well, it can climb on, um, climb on bars and things like that. And uh, a lot of work was put into making it, uh, making it look intelligent. It, it looks like it's going, looks like it knows what's going on. If you're moving on screen, you can kind of see it thinking and wonder what it's thinking. So why is procedural animation important for a game like Ring World? So as we mentioned before, Ring World, um, we're trying to create an ecosystem that feels natural, kind of like watching a nature documentary or uh, a terrarium situation. Like you know in a nature documentary how they'll show like a clearing in a forest or something like that, and you'll see um, some small creature will like come across the camera, and then maybe something's chasing that, or there'll be a squirrel and like a giant bird will swoop down from out of the plane and pick that up. With Rain World, we wanted to play, we wanted to create an experience that felt like that always. Your character's kind of moving through these rooms, and there's like this background of like chaotic, natural stuff going on that feels like a giant organic world. And what procedural animation does is it allows for us to create that believable chaos um, of creatures uh, interacting in unpredictable ways, which you can't really create through traditional like scripted events like you would, and as a result, uh, you have to create. Uh, so with procedural animation, you can create a scenario where the AI behavior, the calculations, and the movements that goes into creating a creature is actually directly equal to what you see on screen. That's an important point, and it may not make sense now, but as you go through, hopefully you'll understand by the end. So a basic example of what all this means is um, like a lizard hunting, for instance. So say you enter a room with a lizard, and you notice it react. It stops what it's doing, and it looks at you. You think to yourself, the lizard sees me. It will sort of attempt to get to your, to your location, and you will, of course, assume it's hunting me. So say you're on a platform, like you're up high, and the lizard can't get to you. You'll see it kind of try different paths to try to reach your position. It may try to climb a wall. It may try to climb a pipe that's close to you. And you can see it kind of switching between these groups. And you think to yourself, like, oh, it's frustrated because it can't get to me. Now, all that's really going on is fairly basic um, AI events. It's pathfinding, it's checking roots, and because you see the creature, and because you see the cause and effect of the creature trying to get to you, and all these actions, you form this narrative in your head of the lizard sees you, the lizard is hungry, it's trying to get to you. And that's very cool. That's kind of the experience that we're trying to go for. So how do we do procedural animation? Important 
aspect is that information is actually only flowing one way between these two, two systems. Uh, the, the position and the velocity and the everything of these filaments and frills, they don't inform the behavior at all. There's no, uh, there's no behavior like flowing from the cosmetics to the actual simulation. It's only going the other way around. Um, and that allows us to have all of the off-screen off -screen interactions which we're trying to achieve. Right? Yeah, because the, the cosmetic layer, you can actually just turn that off and everything will behave exactly the same. Because there's no... Uh, because the, this stuff here, it's only like for show. It doesn't do anything uh, for how the game behaves. So if uh, the creature is off-screen, then this cosmetic layer it can just be turned off which you would still be able to behave as they previously did. Uh, pragmatism. Uh, an, important, an important aspect of, of the approach for the project has been that it's pragmatic and part focused. Which means I, as a programmer and animator, have been less interested in creating like a cool, perfect, beautiful programming systems. Uh, I've been more interested in just getting it to look the way I want it to look. So, yeah, you're an artist. Yeah, I'm originally an artist. I learned programming to make art. Uh, so art is always the end goal. The programming is the way to get there. And that also means that it doesn't really matter to me all that much whether the simulations and stuff like that is accurate. What matters is what does it look like. An example of this is um, like faking it is easier than making it. An example of this is the, the lizards you saw earlier. It looks like their limbs are grabbing the terrain and they're climbing, climbing that way. But actually what is happening is that the body is just like swooping along <laughs> across the ground and the limb will grab somewhere and then as the body swipe swoops out of range when the limb cannot reach anymore it will release and just look for a new place to grab so and if the effect is that it looks like the lizard's crawling along it looks like it's not crawling but actually what's happening is that the body is swooping and the limb is trying to catch up <laughs> smoke and mirrors smoke and mirrors yes another important aspect is that uh, Artificial intelligence and animation are sort of the same in this in this system. Like in many, many types of video games, you have artificial intelligence programmers and you have animators, and the animators make the animations and the art, and then it's up to the programmers to like make the creatures or characters behave. But with this sort of system, the two are actually the same, they're inseparable. And one way you can see that in this uh, case, for example, is that the creature will look around with its head, and the direction it will be looking is informed by where the artificial intelligence thinks that the, the prey is hunting is. So it will look in the direction where, uh, where it's hunting, and that's the AI informing the animation. So you didn't, you didn't uh, frame by frame animate every instance of this happening, correct? No, it, that's that's very much the case. Like I actually didn't do any frame by frame animation at all of this thing. It's only sprites and physics and uh, sprites being rotated and stretched. And in this animation, when the vulture switches between climbing right down here and flaps its wings, is that something that you did intentionally? No, actually that's a mistake. What's happening there is that it's losing its grip with both the tentacles at the same time. And then the artificial intelligence is realizing that I'm falling. So it's switching to the flight, flight locomotion mode and it makes a few wing flaps. And it comes back up and it's continuous to climb. it continues to climb in. And uh, those sort of little mistakes, I actually think they add something to it because it's a little bit like how a real animal would Behave, like maybe slip a little bit and then get back on tra track and stuff like that. If you were to re roll this scenario, if you were to let it play longer, would you ever see this combination of events happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the little snippets of the animation that happen are like extremely unique to the 
to the specific context because there are so many factors that are playing into it. Like, if how it will extend its arm, it's dependent on how the terrain layout around it is, where is a good spot to grab, and at the same time the head is tracking the player and the body is doing something. So there's like millions and millions of possible combinations. So, so let's make a real world creature. What are we making, Joar? Uh, now we're making, we're going to like take you through a little bit step by step how one of these creatures are uh, constructed from, from uh, the bottom. And this one is called the Daddy Long Legs. It's the Daddy Long Legs creature, which is, um, the idea was to have a creature which would be a combination of a spider and a spider's web. So it's a sticky bunch of tentacles. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tentacle horror. You're classic yeah. tentacle horror. <laughs> uh, and it will, it will sort of like extend long tentacles out in every direction. And if you touch the tentacles, they'll go. But it can also climb around. Uh, it can also like uh, get from one place to another by climbing and grabbing. And that's what we're going to show you a little bit more about. All right. So what, what are these floating red blobs here? This is the body of the creature. This is what will later become the central, the central body of the creature. And uh, if any of you have done any games programming, you will recognize this sort of thing. It's fairly basic. Uh, the, the square little thing, it's a thing that's connected to by my mouse cursor. The red this, square is Yeah. Uh, it's connected to the mouse cursor in this uh, animation, and it's the goal for the creature. It's like you want to get to this point. Uh, later in the actual game, where it wants to go, it will be formed by the mouse cursor, but by the dart of the intelligence. Uh, and then there's the half finding at work, which Follow the goal and like move around. around that. So just to just to recap on this, you see the red little diamond that's been around. You. That's like the destination that this quote unquote creature is trying to get to, and these sort of floating blobs is the body you're trying to be building. Around. And a little connection thing that's just to visually show the connection between the two. Yeah, and another thing to note is that the body it sort of shows how actually all of the great world animation physics are working, which is round lumps <laughs> that are connected to each other at certain distances. Uh, so it's like a point which has a radius and it has a bunch of connections to other points and it tries to keep the distance of the connection uh, constant. Alright. Looks a bit more complicated now, right? Yeah, it's getting worse. It's getting worse over uh, this is This is a bunch of legs. And as you might recognize, it's the same system for like a tentacle floating leg thing as the tentacle monster plants you saw earlier. We like tentacles. Let's just. Let's there's that there's some quite a lot of tentacles in the So, what are the, what are the ghostly limbs that are kind of have the square, the blue squares at the end of them that are floating around? Yeah, that, that's a little bit confusing right now. But basically, like the floppy, the floppy uh, things that are in that round dots and sticks, that's the physics simulation. Whereas the square transparent things, that is what will be the AI, um, the artificial intelligence limb. So it will have an idea of where it ideally wants the limb to be, and then the physics limb will try to align with. The AI limb. Would you say that the, the, the AI limb, the ghostly one, is like the brains of the limb? Uh, the yes, yeah, that's an excellent explanation. Or maybe with the intent, is the, the desired position. This will make more sense, I assure you. So now we're getting into climbing a little bit more. Because what we want is we want this creature to use the legs to but if the legs are just flopping around, that doesn't do any good. We want the legs to reach out to terrain and grab. And basically, if you think about a climbing, climbing action, what it is, is that it's looking in front of you, finding something to grab, grabbing it, pulling yourself past the thing you grabbed, then releasing it, and looking up again. And the idea is to make this, uh, make this artificial, artificial uh, behave like that. 
So what do we have on screen here? We have this red limb, this red hook thing. Yeah. Now we're the, oh, this this little like, illustration. Now we're talking about one specific okay, one specific particle, and that's the red, the red uh, hook thing. And what we want this tentacle to do is that we want it to find a good position, to probably a little bit in front of where the creature is going, and we want it to go there and grab. Um, the yellow dot is the best possible grabbing position. So if the tentacle could grab it anywhere, it would go for the yellow dot. But now the yellow dot is actually hovering in thin air, so there's nothing to grab there. So what we want to do instead is we want to find a spot that is on terrain but is close as close as possible to the yellow So what is the green dot then? The green dot is uh, the green dot is basically like a shank. So every single frame I will pick a random position in the room and uh, that's the green dot. And there's also the blue dot and what I do is that I compare how close is the green dot to the yellow dot and how close is the blue dot to the yellow dot. And if the green one is closer, then I move the blue one to the green one. Otherwise, I do nothing. And over the course of time, this will make the blue dot move towards the ideal position. Because every time I pick a random spot and I shake this one better than it is, I move to the so then you have this blue arrow. Basically, it's been established that that block in the center with the green dots on it is the better. Yeah. So now the, the blue, like the blue most spot is like the best possible, is the best possible option, and that means the tentacle will go for the blue spot and grab on. And here we can see it in motion. Like the, the yellow dots are the uh, the yellow dots are the ideal positions, and then the tentacles will like reach out and grab for something that's close, but also uh, on time. And what's this? It looks like it's affected by gravity. Yes. It's slowly moving forward and bouncing. that? So this is a little bit, again, like faking it. Faking it is easier than making it. Instead of doing an actual rope simulation and having everything like uh, physically accurate, what's happening here is that every frame I count how many of the tentacles are contacting terrain. And depending on how many tentacles are contacting terrain, I grab it into the central body less or more. So if no tentacles are grabbing on, then the body will just be in free fall. But if all the tentacles are grabbing, the body will not be affected by gravity at all. And the eye sort of, or when you're looking at this, it's sort of like, looks like it's supporting itself because you can see that the fewer tentacles the more it's weighted down. Whereas in actuality it's not supported by the tentacles at all. It's just floating in the air or floating in the air a little bit less depending on uh, depending on how many limbs are back. I think this one is good to see too the relationship between the AI limbs and the actual physical limbs because you can kind of see the ghost of the limbs will reach out fast like find a spot and then you see the actual like dotted line tail will go up and grab it up. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're trying to follow up as best as they can. Uh, then, then comes the cosmetic detail layer, uh, which you saw sort of with the, with the, with the other tentacle <laughs> uh, So. This is what's actually going on according to the game logic, but this is what's shown to the player. And even more detail and even more like uh, limbs and foamy things are added on top to make it look more terrifying. So here basically only four of the limbs are actually active, correct? Yeah, four of the limbs are actually pulling and dragging, but then there are also other other limbs and tentacles and appendages that just flop around to make it look more like So in the cosmetics on this, like if you had two different of these daddy long legs creatures, would they look similar? What would they how what's the relationship between them? All of them look different because the the, the body layout is also just it's not only damage. So like all of the bumps and 
lipids <laughs> are all uh, generated from a random seed. So this particular individual will always look like this, but another individual will always look another way. And every time you play the game, you get a different, different set of creatures but yeah. as a result of this. Here it is in the game environment, hunting poor little slug. Yeah, and the idea with this creature is that it, hum it hunts by sound. So you can see as the slug that is connecting with the floor, the eye things on the body will blink. That's, that's the way it's indicating that it hurt something. And as soon as it hears something, it will send the tentacle out and like, swoop around uh, to check, check the area out. And if there's a creature, it will grab it and eat it, as illustrated. <laughs> so in taking you through this creation of the daddy long legs, we've shown how you will be arrived at the end result, which is a gross tentacle monster. Through certain technical choices, the faking of the weight, the inverse kinematics of the limbs, uh, faking the look of climbing, etc. The goal of this was the art, right? We wanted to arrive at a tentacle monster. But we weren't really concerned with having the ideal or proper solutions to this. We were only we weren't focusing on road physics, we weren't focusing on any sort of simulation other than just like, does it look cool? Yeah. Yeah, basically, uh, very, very little interest in like perfectly optimized and mathematically beautiful systems. Rather, I think if any actual programmer would go into the code, they would be horrified at what they saw. Uh, instead, it's only about getting to the, getting to the end result. And the circumstance of this is that you're coming from an art perspective, so you can make these choices, correct? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, coming, I'm coming from the art perspective, and code was always sort of like a tool to get to an art idea. Uh, and I think this is maybe a little bit the general, general takeaway we want to get in our talk, I suppose, that there's this idea out there that some people are artistic and they are they have interest in creative ideas and other people are technical and they know how to solve technical problems. And um, I would very much like to challenge that idea because I think solving technical problems can be a very powerful part too. The technical aspects can really be uh, a thing of self-expression. Well, and in between these two techniques of art and code, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in the center that you couldn't get to otherwise, correct? Yeah, exactly. Especially in video games, it's a very common thing to have like artists that do art and animation, and then programmers that implement the behaviors. And the artists will make their art and they'll send it to the programmers, and the programmers will try to put it into the video game. Um, I think that's fine, but I think People might miss out because in between art and programming, there are many interesting things going on in the gray area in between. And those things you might not really be able to reach them from either side. You need to have both disciplines, so to speak. So you're saying that an artist should learn to code? Yes. And <laughs> a coder should learn some art? Yeah. I, I, I definitely think like whichever, whichever side of the spectrum you're coming from, there's a huge benefit to try to like reach over the gap a little bit towards the other side. So the more the more you think that you are just an art person with the way yes, that you can never do anything technical, go for it. And if you think you're technical and you never like, have any interesting ideas, go for it. And it's, it's important and fun and good for your creative output. As much overlap as possible. You might find the whole world in between there. Like, yes. We do. So that's our talk. Thank you guys very much. Thank you very much.
that, that, that's a really good question because actually quite a lot of the creative decisions are informed by the tech, the tech, and maybe even in particular the technical limitations. Like what will happen is I have some idea and I start like trying to implement it, but then the technology has its limitations and it like pushes it in a new direction. And then um, if you if you don't have too rigid an idea of what you want, so you you're like open to change a little bit, you can often go with the technical technical limitations and then end up with something that might be even more interesting. I think a lot of our like our intentions were very simple for a lot of these creatures and just the game in general. We wanted to like make something that was cool. Like we go into this thinking like let's do a cool creature, what can we do? And then we find some technical reasons that we can't do this or that, and it's sort of like the path that we take down there come, becomes very organic, I guess, as a result. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Sort of influences their opinions. We really went super deep 
deep into this stuff, and a lot of it isn't very visible in the game if you're, unless you play it like very often. You might see these kind of like group behaviors. To a first time player, this looks like it's completely <laughs> <laughs> unpredictable and weird, but the system's right in there. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone else have a question? something really amazing and extraordinary and I would just love to explore the world. For me the game is too difficult for me. I'm really terrible at this kind of stuff. So I'm interested if you, if you maybe consider to add some casual or tourist modes for lame players like me. It's actually implemented. If you have the Steam version you can play as the EC, the EC, the EC or Spudcat and it should be Unless you're already on the easy mode. <laughs> <laughs> then I can help you. Okay, thank you. Okay, one of the issues, with this game, we were really trying to show sort of a de a de empowerment fantasy, if that makes sense. Like so many video games, you have this kind of concept of you start out as weak, and then over the course of the game, you sort of like develop powers, and you get guns, and you have like missiles, and by the end, you're just this invincible, like, death dealing beast and nothing can stop you. And we're very interested in the, the beginnings of this game, of the beginnings of those sort of games, where you're afraid, like Metroid or something like that, where you're sort of sneaking around and like everything that moves is kind of, is, is, is potentially a threat. So with Rainbow, we really wanted to take people and put them into the mindset of a little lost creature that's like literally being, you know, hunted and predated on. There is no, there's no like, progression of the character at all throughout the game. You start with the exact same abilities as you end with. The only difference is that you build your knowledge of the world. Yeah, through observation you see patterns and behaviors for creatures and you sort of like put puzzle pieces together for how things work. And while a person who's played the game for 10 hours and a person who's just starting, the player character is exactly the same. But you, you'll notice these tremendous differences in how like, a player will approach that. But the problem is, is, as a result, there's a huge difficulty curve to begin with. And you're just kind of thrown in this thing, and you have to like piece these things together by yourself. And that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of time investment for people. Like the gameplay generally takes around six, like 40 to 60 hours to get through, and that's just through like the first main arc of the game. And that's just not a realistic thing to expect of players. Which we now know. <laughs> we have learned so much. We have learned our best game. <laughs> but as a result, I think the game exists. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a niche community for games like this, which really in, you have to just play constantly and learn, and uh, they've, they've been satiated with the <laughs> with world. Next time, though, I'm sure you will. Anybody else have any?
So if you have 40 to 60 hours to drop by, yeah, come on, come on over. Okay. You know I would be happy to take you through a guided tour of every single one of them. Thanks. Anybody else? These are all very good questions, by the way. Hi, thanks for the talk again. And I was wondering, say I'm, I'm an artist, and I would like to learn some of the procedure of animation. Where would you recommend me to start? <laughs> where, yeah. where can I learn this? The thing is, like, my, my image to it was sort of just messing around with... Uh, messing around with code, I guess. Like, when I was a teenager, I made a little bit of video games, and I was interested in animation. And sort of slowly, I started to drift into procedural animation. It was not really a conscious decision. So it's difficult for me to answer where to start, but flash, flash maybe. It's dead though. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think maybe maybe like you can you can try doing animation in Blender or something like that, and try to do like the inverse kinematic stuff and things things along those lines, that, that will give you an idea. But if you want to take the path I took, like, make a small, dumb, tiny video game and try to just get some sense of uh, procedural animation in there. Because procedural animation, at the end of the day, is programming. And what you need is you need a little bit of programming knowledge. So start by making Pong and then make like the Pong paddles have an arm on each paddle. But swoop around and yourself. Do you do, do 3D graphic work? No, a bit. Right. Gotcha. But like in software? Yeah. Okay. And just traditional animation, maybe pretty far for it, but not essential. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was concerned maybe you actually did hand drawn art, and I was like, actually, maybe this is terrible. <laughs> but, so, <laughs> no, but if you're already on a computer, you're, you're off way there, right? But the, the key is. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. Do, you, um, do you ever work with Unity or anything like that? Yeah, uh, <coughs> Thanks guys for being in the audience.